Greetings. Welcome to the Diabetic Mogu Podcast. On this podcast, we will offer standard and recommended practice of not only managing your diabetes well, but how you can get involved in advocating for proper access to healthcare and bringing opportunities within the diabetes online community. It's Tino, a patient advocate and a certified diabetes educator. I'm Hona. I'm a medical doctor. Together, we want to raise awareness, open a discussion about diabetes, share ideas, thoughts, different perspectives, and overall create a safe environment for everyone who needs to express his or her thoughts. We'll be hosting a series of podcast episodes from people living with diabetes, caregivers, health care providers, researchers, and we encourage you to get involved, to get engaged, and come up together to create the change that we need. Hello everyone and welcome to the Diabetic Mogu podcast. We have together with us Professor May. Hello Tino. Hello Professor May. I would kindly ask you to introduce yourself. You do so many things we will get in through. But yeah, firstly an introduction. Thanks so much Tino and uh, Connor for inviting me to this interview. Very honored. What shall I say? I'm May Ng. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. I have three children. I'm married. I have been managing patients and looking after children and young people with uh, endocrine conditions and diabetes for more than 20 years. And of course, I met Tino when he was one of the ISPAD roving reporters. I've been part of roving reporters for many, many years and part of ISPAD for almost 20 years as well. I suppose that's a nutshell. Feel free to ask me anything else. Thank you so much, Professor May. It's an honor, really, because you're a renowned person, and we believe that your reputation precedes you, not just diabetes, but in pediatrics. Today, I just wanted to ask you this question. I want to say that you always knew what you wanted to be. As a small child, you would say pediatrician, not a doctor. While training in pediatrics, you specialized on oncology at first, then you switched to pediatric endocrinology. Can you explain what led you to make that kind of a decision? Thanks, Tino. Yes, I think that uh, was on the uh, Lancet uh, interview was written. And they did ask me what made me go into pediatrics. As young as I could remember, I always wanted to be involved in looking after children. I think if I wasn't a pediatrician or wasn't a doctor, I'd probably have uh, opened up a nursery. <laughs> I feel like I have an affinity with children, I think. I think that they are such unique human beings. that, And it takes a special kind of doctor to be a good doctor to children and young people. So I think I just always knew that was my vocation, that I was would be looking after children and even in university pediatrics was my favorite specialty I got the pediatric prize I suppose I had to work hard because I was born in Malaysia as an ethnic minority Chinese Malaysia is predominantly a Muslim country to work very hard to be where you want to be so I was lucky I was given scholarships to study in Singapore as part of the ASEAN scholarship program then I got a full scholarship to study medicine in Sydney University Australia and from there, I came to the UK and got my grants. I continued in the pediatric specialty. And as you say, I started off with pediatric oncology in Australia and even wrote my first four papers as a medical student in pediatric oncology. I was year four and year five. And during my elective, I was attached to a Malaysian hospital with a fantastic mentor. I published my first four papers in pediatric oncology and was going towards that. And I even had a 12-month uh, rotation in pediatric oncology. But I, when I say I have an affinity to looking after children, pediatric oncology is a whole different ballgame. I became a little bit too close to the children and some children don't survive. I wrote papers on acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, and the survival rates, although are fairly high, but there are children who don't survive. Neuroblastoma, I remember my first cases were always imprinted in my memory. I, I think I just couldn't think or see myself doing oncology forever. I'd have to be quite apart from the family. I think to be a good doctor, you have to have some boundaries. And I think I realized then after about two years that I needed to move away from oncology. So I chose endocrinology, which is interesting because it's a wonderful topic about hormones, specialty about hormones and things that can go wrong and how we would either replace it because usually it, hormones are deficient or hormones go bonkers and works too much. So I thought it was a fascinating specialty. 
I agree so much with that. You said that children are so special and people who are involved in medical field, but not in uh, pediatrics, they tend to have the idea that children are just smaller humans, but they're just children. They're a type of uh, patients as a whole unit. And I agree so much. And I think that oncology and endocrinology have in common the, the chronic illnesses that you have patients that you see them developing, especially children growing up getting to school, getting to university later, maybe. Maybe that also was a common factor that made you transition from oncology to endocrinology. Yes, that's a good point, Connor. I think they are interrelated, isn't it? Because now I see post-oncology endocrine late effects patients. Endocrine is actually a chronic condition like diabetes is, isn't it? And you have the wonderful opportunity to get to know the young person right up till the 18. You get to know the families, their lives. It's a long-term relationship that you can support. Yeah. And also in terms of studying these specialties, you have to understand mechanism is so much of a understanding process. And then to go into clinical action, the next question, I tend to assume that you want a holistic approach to medicine, which is not just the patient, not just the studying, not just the clinic. And you obtained a master in law, an MBA. I assume that you want to approach medicine holistically, but I would also explain to us what made you take these qualifications. I want to answer the first question. Uh, absolutely. I think medicine is holistic. Medicine is not about just fixing a problem or giving a medication. And I treat all my patients in an individualistic sort of approach. But I think to answer your question, I didn't set out to do a master's and a PhD after my basic degree. I was given opportunities, I suppose. I won scholarships and I want grants. So I did my master's in science, which was in diabetes and endocrinology, because that was fascinating. And it was around my region at the time. Won the Medical Research Council grant, which was looking into a randomized trial on thyroxine supplementation across the country. That allowed me to do my PhD, and I did it in a neonatal endocrinology, which was an area that not many people knew about. So that was a really great opportunity to complete my PhD. With the regards to the holistic part of it, even as a consultant, I am accredited in solution-focused approaches. The psychological interventions like solution-focused therapy and grief is very important. The way we speak to families and young people to have an important use of language, that, that's a holistic part of it. How I got into law is completely different. I think I just almost fell into it because at the time, medical, legal, this is about 20 years ago. And even now, there's probably a handful of uh, medical legal experts in the UK doing pediatric endocrinology. So my mentor, my PhD supervisor at the time was doing a lot of medical legal in neonatal brain injury. And I was doing neonatal endocrinology as my PhD. So I got to know a little bit about medical legal work. I then thought, okay, it's an interesting area. Not many people know about it and not many people dare venture into it because you're up in the court with barristers and lawyers. So I thought, let's have a go. Somehow I ended up doing the master's in law. I was probably the first doctor in that program in University of Liverpool. And since then, I've been very active in medical legal work because there's so few of us in the UK doing medical legal work in particularly pediatric endocrine and diabetes. How I ended up with an MBA a couple of years ago was another story. I suppose my view is always that we always need to learn, isn't it? I think we, we cannot learn enough. And I always feel that I need to learn more. And I always feel that I don't know enough. So the MBA was fell into my scope, I suppose, because I ended up doing hospital management. I became the clinical director, then I became the associate medical director. And hospital management is an important area because uh, most hospitals are managed by managers who are not doctors, as you know. So I thought we need a bridge. Because I was the clinical director and associate medical director, I was in a lot of business meetings, and I felt a little bit inadequate, you know, they talk about all these business words and business terms. And I thought, gee, I need to learn more because I need to give our side of the story. We need to be the bridge between doctors and managers, hospital managers. So I, I did 
the MBA. And I finished this, you know, I got a merit in finance and hospital management so that I can be a more knowledgeable voice, I suppose, when I'm at the board or when I'm talking to hospital managers. And I think we need that. My thesis at the time for the MBA was literally becoming the bridge. We need more doctors sometimes to be the bridge, to be part of clinical management, because hospital managers know a lot about finance and the business side of things that doctors are not taught in university. Doctors know a lot about frontline stuff, what services, what patient quality is important. So where's this bridge? And, and I think the bridge is maybe people like us, qualified as doctors, but also qualified in business side of things. And that's how I got my MBA. Uh, so it really wasn't something I set out to do. It's something that part of my journey of learning that came about in my career. I recently just qualified as an acupuncturist. I'm a licensed acupuncturist because, again, it was an opportunity. I've grown up in a Chinese culture where everyone did acupuncture when I was so I had the opportunity to look at western medical acupuncture and it took me 18 months of studies exams and I can now do acupuncture I suppose this gives you a glimpse of what I am like if there is an opportunity to learn, I usually take it. I usually think that we don't know enough. And I suppose that's a good view. If we think we know too much, I'll be a bit worried. So yeah, that's your nutshell. I also believe that what you did concerning law, I think especially public health is so connected with law and we're not trained as healthcare professionals. In Greece especially, we graduate from medical school and we don't know our rights. We don't know how we can treat a patient and be safe as a doctor at the same time with taking risk and when to ask for help. Also, as long as it concerns the management of hospitals, again, medical doctors aren't trained enough. You're covering all that, building that bridges to cover the lack of professionals that are both in the medical field and in the administration field makes me feel humbled. I admire this work of you. Dino? As I was trying to say, just like what Professor May had said on one of her interviews, she was like, hey, I would rather describe myself as a hormone expert than sure, not just in diabetes, but on autism, for special needs that children have, considering your background, or what you have in your family, and you having to be a master, like an expert in all those kind of things that you're working on. As a multi-award-winning pediatrician um, who recently got awarded an order of the British Empire and Augie for the work in improving diabetes care and for people with autism and disabilities, what can you say to the aspiring students, junior medical doctors, other ACPs for inspiration, and even researchers that might even want to know? And it will serve as a motivation for others to do the same in the years to come. What can you say to them? Thanks, Tito. That's an interesting question because the OBE, obviously by the late Queen Elizabeth II, has been a huge surprise when it came. I have to thank, obviously, the uh, autism societies or the di diabetes societies or the patient groups that have nominated me. And for aspiring doctors, to be fair, I, I think it's not about getting the awards. It's about getting your inner satisfaction in the work that you do and how that helps patients and how it helps families. It's really not about getting... The award's always a surprise. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, you get a letter and or you, they've awarded you something and it's like, great. But actually, nothing changes. The work that I do with autism has been 18 years long because my son was diagnosed with quite severe autism when he was two. He was non-verbal until he was nine years old. This was a long time ago, almost two decades ago when people didn't really understand autism and I didn't want to keep him in the house all the time. I, I wanted to take him to places, restaurants, museums, and he would have a lot of difficulties. So I set up raising autism awareness for many, many years and I fundraised for National Autistic Society. He inspired my first book, A Journey with Brendan, because I couldn't find a book that would help parents, families, healthcare professionals about a lot of topics that I've written in A Journey with Brendan. So topics like toilet training, topics about sleep, topics about all the miraculous cures that autism, you know, people have put out for, but, but they don't quite work, do they? It's Sometimes it's about acceptance and early intervention. So I think the work with autism is personal to me as a pediatrician. I also see many, many families with autism, learning disabilities. Autism and diabetes is getting so much more common, for example. My second son was diagnosed with deafness, congenital deafness, and they're only two years apart. And my third child, Corrine, was born 29 weeks, so she was premature. So one part of my life, three children under five years old, all with 
special needs at the time was crazy. You know, I, I used to ask, you know, if you believe in God, why me? But sometimes he gives us challenges, isn't it? And my challenge is always to give the best that I can to them, because that's I always say to families and, and even a healthcare professional, the children only have us as advocates. They sometimes don't have a voice loud enough. So we have to be their advocates, whether you're a mother, a father, a grandparent. So I give my children the best outcome they have. My son, is, well, he's in a special needs autism college. Uh, he speaks, but not wonderful conversations. But, uh, you know, he only started being verbal at nine. But this was, you know, seven, eight years of intensive early intervention. I find that I have the empathy, I suppose, or families realize that when they read my book, actually they go, oh, you know what we're going through. Or even diabetes, toddlers with type 1 diabetes, really difficult for families sometimes, isn't it? So sometimes I guess I have that other experience in my personal life to have that empathy or to have that understanding what they're going through. And I think for doctors, aspiring doctors, current doctors, future, you know, be aware, I suppose, that every family has got their challenges and you're there to help. Don't dictate. And I think don't judge. Sometimes many people judge, isn't it? And I find that difficult because I've been judged as a mom. It's not easy. But when you're on the other side, when you have that really important role as a doctor, as a healthcare professional, as a nurse, as a psychologist, that's such an important role because you're there to be able to support and give them that little bit of space or give them that little bit of hope or guidance to make their lives a little bit easier. I think it's really not about awards. <laughs> Do you know it? That comes when it's recognized. I always say that it's always a surprise to me. So I thank you to many of the patients, families, associations, societies, but it was never the goal. The goal has always been to raise autism awareness, to raise deaf awareness. That came from my personal life. Diabetes, I have set up a diabetes charitable fund because my hospital didn't have any money to set up educational events. And now we get to do that two to three times every year, evenings with lots of prizes, food. And that allows families in the region to enjoy the company together while learning. So I've raised lots of funds and gotten very good at it, I suppose, both to raise autism awareness, to raise diabetes awareness, to raise death awareness. But all that has to come from our inner motivation, isn't it? I think if our motivations are not there, then it's hard to do. And, and the motivation cannot be getting an award. It cannot be getting a certificate because that's completely wrong. I think that's the wrong motive. Thank you so much. I think this one, it saves much on what you're going through. And it's always great for even for the parents who come to your house seeking for advice or reviews because they're also going through something. You have all these unique experiences. If she is going through the same and then she's giving us advice, then we can have an assurance that it is possible. We can do so much with our children, not just trying to keep them in a corner, not having to expose them. But what you did was just great because recently you were all over the world. You went to Korea and then you went to Japan with what the children really liked. And then you were trying to you have that kind of life because I mean you have you have a life like you said life intervened with your research career which was laid before you but also you had to make some tough decisions because family matters the most. I think that life is not what happens to you but what you do about it when you receive like a bad life situation or a difficult uh, moment firstly self-healing like you feel that you understand the condition better and then you can connect with other people and i've seen it as a type 1 diabetic when i started to connect with other people with diabetes i felt less lonely i found support because there was just unique connection and communications in one way it may help you as well as a mother of children with autism for example Absolutely. I think that's exactly what you're saying, Connie, is that if we go into a self-depreciating mode, then it doesn't help, isn't it? So you learn more about your condition, which is why I always encourage my patients who are diagnosed with type 1. There's so much out there. You know, we will guide you to what is good resources and learn more about it. Peer-to-peer -peer support is invaluable because usually type 1 diabetes is not that common. 29,000 children in almost 65 million in the UK. So that's only one child a school. But we create the opportunities for them to meet each other. So we have parent peer to peer support, we have children's, and we have teen peer to peer support. And they are so happy when they find 
someone else is having a pump or injecting during meals, they're not alone. In and I think that's so important for families and for healthcare professionals to be that guide to do that. Yeah, coming to the next question, you're the chair of Diabetes UK Research Steering Group for children and young people with diabetes. I would like to ask you what are your aspirations and maybe your future goals in this uh, position? What are you looking forward to? I chair the UK's Diabetes Research Steering Group specifically for the group children and young people. The group has got representation from young people from 18 to 25. And one of our biggest aims, uh, and the project is currently going on at the moment, and hopefully we'll have the uh, publications and outcomes, is we want to have the voice of the child and what is important to them and what is their research priorities. One of the things that we always say is sometimes the research priorities is the healthcare professionals' research priorities, or it's the parents' research priorities, because we're asking the parents, not the child. So in recent times, this is literally a few months now, but it's been about a, a one or two year work project. We wanted to create something that comes directly from the voice of the child. We want children as young as six years old, eight years old, to tell us what is important to them. They have a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, but what is important to them? What would they like to find out? What would the future be like for them? What would they like the future to be? In a way, what is our research priorities? And that's important because there's diabetes research steering groups for uh, adults, complications. The one I chair is specifically for children again. And for me, it's important to ask them at the source, to ask the child what is research priorities like to them. So hopefully we will get this out uh, in the next six to 12 months. But uh, it's an exciting project that we do. This patient-centered approach also comes to my first answer that we tend to underestimate children and we tend to think that they don't know, but they know because they're human beings, they know their needs, they're experiencing their condition. We accompany them as medical doctors or parents do, but they know how they feel and that is so much neglected and overseen because healthcare professionals tend to focalize only on the medical part to see the blood test coming well, the overall health. Health, but giving a voice to children is so important for research, for next steps to treatment and approach to young patients generally. I think it's incredibly important. I mean, I had a young child. He was six, seven years old, but he came from a different region. He thought that his diabetes clinics every three months was for his parents. <laughs> he had no idea that the clinic was... You can get the picture, isn't it? That the parents are asked all their views, but actually we have to focus on the child. And it's how our language is as well. So language is incredibly important. And you know about language matters and diabetes and so importantly in our whole team. That is what the child thought. The child thought that his diabetes clinics his parents, not for him. He was just a spectator. We have to change that view. Oh, great. This is amazing. And I think this one naturally transitions to the next question that we wanted to ask on championing on the um, children's voices in diabetes. Basically, we cannot thank you enough for everything that you do. You have been continually championing the voice of children with diabetes in guiding future research. What do you believe stands out as a contributing factor to the unacceptable inequalities in access to diabetes technology? It's a difficult one. You know, I have given a lot of talks in the UK, we have 100% uh, submissions over almost 200 children diabetes centers. This is information you can get on the internet. It's not unknown. And for seven years running, we have health inequalities, which shows that children at areas of lowest social deprivation quartiles were having less access to technology such as pumps and continuous glucose monitoring. We also showed that there were disparities among ethnic groups. Children of black ethnic minorities were getting almost half the number of technology of white children. And this was seen year on year and getting worse over the last six to seven years. So we needed to look at why. Why was this happening? I don't have the answers for you now, Tina, because uh, we are currently leading a grant to look at this. So it's a national study. It's funded by Diabetes UK. So we are looking at barriers to diabetes technology in children, specifically looking at uh, why there are these worsening health inequalities amongst ethnic groups, as well as among 
areas of social deprivation. And the study is ongoing with my co-investigators, Professor Lawton and Dr. Darko in Leicester in Edinburgh, and it's a national study. But yeah, we are undertaking research to understand why. We are seeing very similar disparities, health inequalities in the U.S., for example. I did a talk at the ISPAT plenary last year on this. We just need to understand what are the barriers. Are the barriers healthcare professionals being the gatekeepers? We don't know. Are the barriers due to perceptions and behaviours of either healthcare professionals or families? We don't know. I don't have the answers to that, but I think this is an important area. And hopefully we will have some answers when the study concludes end of next year. We, as people who are being part of our society, but also as healthcare professionals, we are not well informed and then trained on how to approach or how to communicate with people with autism. We tend to just ignore them, which is usually wrong. And also as healthcare professionals, it is very important to know how to get a medical history or how to communicate with a patient who has autism with respect to his needs or to his privacy, because I've seen people with autism always being accompanied with some someone who can talk for them, but I don't know if that is always right. What advice or what tip knowledge can you give to us on how to communicate and approach people in the spectrum? I know the spectrum is broad, but I think you can guide us. I have quite a few patients. I think we have about 15% of our type 1 diabetes children and young people who has autism. And the spectrum is wide. Some can be quite verbal and some can be more on the severe end of the spectrum with high dependencies. I think it's important to have some basic training. In the UK, the NHS now has mandated that all healthcare professionals have a basic training on learning disabilities such as autism. And if there is an awareness that there are some challenges to communications, for example, or uh, social interactions or speech and language we need to find out how we can advocate for them better. You're quite right. A lot of them are accompanied by their parents or carers who know them best. And that's fine. They need these advocates. But I also think that we also need to give them the opportunity to be part of the consultation. We need to have more time, for example, for them. We need to have more visual leaflets. Many autistic young people are visual learners. That's why something called PECS, Picture Exchange Communication, system is has been used for young children with autism and i don't think we have any of these adapt resources or leaflets or anything of the sort we're not just talking about autism we're talking also about children with intellectual disabilities other learning disabilities and i've written paper for the lancet on the international day of people with disabilities i think i can send the link to you but it's an important area that i think the gap is on knowledge and how do we interact or have a consultation with a young person a child or even an adult with learning disabilities with autism the gap is that we don't have the resources at the moment to help them be part of the conversation, to help them understand their condition. The gap is also with, for example, NHS waiting lists, very short consultation times, busy clinics. So the environment is not conducive to these young people. So there are a lot of areas that I discussed in Lancet paper. You know, as we all say, perhaps more research needs to be done. There's very, very little research done on how do we do better, especially in an area of type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes with concomitant autism diagnosis or learning disabilities. I think there is a huge gap at the moment in knowledge. Uh, let's hope that more research is going to be done so we can get some guidelines or some knowledge about the specific topic. Thank you so much, Professor. I think you had also touched on it, maybe I think at the beginning, speaking about autism and why it is very important, whereas we do not have much attention on it, especially diabetes and autism as it is. But there's a growing interest in terms of people wanting to research. But we think people like you are doing so much to raise this awareness, writing books about it, shaping from your personal experiences, not just from your research, having to ask other parents some of the questions that you can ask yourself to say, hey, I've seen this happening. So I think I can write a bit more about it, asking so many questions. I think this is great. Thank you so much. It's a good thing that you have these experiences from lived experience. Considering that you are responsible for providing advice, we should do training, educational support for healthcare professionals in Southeast Asia. 
as a volunteer for action for diabetes. Well, we didn't know people like you can actually volunteer because you have a lot on your plate. So I think it serves as a motivation to us that we have to continue volunteering regardless of us having to save different bodies like we should do. What has been your biggest key learning points like over the years and how can we support thy incredible efforts? And we quote, if it stopped suddenly, tomorrow mean people can die. Like this is what you said on your recent interview. We're all busy, isn't it? I, I really am very, very busy. I look after the kids and I don't even have a cleaner. You know, I clean the house when I'm free. But when we were approached by Action for Diabetes, there is no way I could have said no. It's impossible to say no to help this incredible nonprofit organization. Action for Diabetes is the only NGO that is providing insulin, free insulin, free blood glucose strips, free education and support to Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is where I'm from. I was born in Malaysia as an ethnic minority Chinese. I know all the countries, cultures and everything. They didn't have a doctor supporting their incredible initiatives. They were providing free insulin. This was guaranteed, okay? So when they take on a child at any age, they guarantee provision of the insulin until they're 25, which is really important because sometimes when I visit East Asia, People want to give me their excess insulin. But I say, well, I can't just give them a box. What happens after that? There has to be continuity. Action for Diabetes is a charity that ensures continuity. They didn't have a doctor. They had all these important uh, initiatives. They give scholarships out to young people who, after 25, might want to be an apprentice, being a tailor, or go to university. But the important thing is that if this charity, like you say, and I said it at the interview with The Lancet, was that if this charity stopped, we will have hundreds and thousands of children who will not survive. Well, I live in a fortunate country, and many of us do, in developed countries where insulin is provided free. And in almost all of the countries in Southeast Asia, it is not free. Blood glucose testing strips are not free. And I presented this at the plenary in ISPAD. Families spend 80% of their income on insulin and blood. How do they manage that? But they have to because they don't survive otherwise. So the families are dependent on nonprofit organizations and charity organizations like Action for Diabetes. And Life for a Child does very similar initiatives. We need more of them. We need more governments to understand that insulin is a life-saving medication and it has to be provided as part of the health care. Families who spend more than 80% of their income on just insulin, they can barely survive. So just to answer your question, I can't say no. However busy we are, I can't say no. I feel that I'm capable of helping. In the past few years of being the voluntary chief medical advisor, we've published 10 papers. We've now endorsed by ISPAD. We're working with ISPAD to do more. We're going into Philippines and Indonesia because they need our help, isn't it? Access to free medication is part of WHO's initiatives, but many, many countries, and you must know, Tina, even in Africa, many, many countries, it is not provided free at source. So if we are given the opportunities as old doctors like me or young doctors like you guys, and we are given the opportunity to be a voice to help global diabetes index be better, then we can't say no, isn't it? And I think that's the important thing. Action for Diabetes is an amazing organization to be guaranteed at least till 25 years that you will get insulin for free with blood glucose strips. I've never seen that anywhere else, I have to say. But they fundraise so much. When I first started, there was only five people in the whole organization. <laughs> and all these other volunteers, five, can you imagine? Started out with the founders, Charles Toomey and Jerry Gore. And Jerry Gore has type 1 diabetes. And Charles lives in Thailand. He sees the health inequalities there. But without people to provide or to advocate or to fundraise, then we've got to do it, I think. Saying that you cannot say no is such a common phrase for medical doctors who tend to help mm -hmm. charities. But I think that the most difficult part is cleaning your house. I think it's the most boring thing to do. I think it's more difficult. <laughs> I to clean the toilets every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's more difficult than the charity you do. I'm joking, but yeah, I really admire that. <laughs> and 
But now that the kids are a bit older, I get to ask them to do things too. So yesterday we did gardening, we did weeding and gardening for a few hours every every weekend. But we manage our time. I think I'm a good time organizer. <laughs> yeah, I can say. Coming to the next question, as you've already mentioned, uh, you have, I think you have 200 publications. You have written three books. And I could ask what else could we expect from you <laughs> in this field? Oh, Connor, I really don't know. Everything comes as part of a journey that happens. Like I said, I don't set out to do it. A Journey with Brendan is my first book and my son was the inspiration, but so were the families with autism. They were really struggling and it needed a book to help them. I mean, in the appendix, I have all the resources for them to help with early intervention online, how to write a legal letter, quoting the law constitution so that they can ask for the help that they need. So these were needed at the time. My second book, Me and My Hormones, again, I found a gap for families, students, healthcare professionals, just to find out what are all the hormones that could go wrong, what are the treatments, and what are the investigations. It's quite popular. I had a lot of good feedback from medical students, nurses, doctors, GPs. And again, I wrote that because I needed a book like that. And because over the 20 years, I've been creating so many leaflets, you know, a leaflet on growth hormone deficiency, a leaflet on what is normal puberty, a leaflet on what are normal hormones, and then what could go wrong. I simply put it together into a book. And my most recent book was also a gap. It was about everything else you need to know about type 1 diabetes and management and technology. So this is a new thing, fairly new, isn't it? What is time and range? What are continuous glucose monitoring? What is an AGP? What are pumps? What are all the different insulins and its durations of actions? So I researched and again, it took me a few years to write this book, but I think I write them because I find that there are gaps that people need to know rather than I set out to write. I think I write them because I think, well, there's a gap. Where is a book that tells me all about the different insulin, whether it's uh, human insulin or analog insulins, the durations? At peak actions, where are all the pumps? What is technology? What is diabetes tech today? So the book is always written in a very simple language. All the books that I've written are hopefully easy to read in the style that I use, the way I write it for patients and families. But I don't know as to what's next because I'm already so busy. <laughs> I'm in SP, European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology, in two days' time. I chaired the ISPAD an SP, e-learning platform. I've been involved since it was created in 2012, 2015, and now I chair the committee for the last few years. And it is a free e-learning platform of pediatric endocrine and diabetes. It has more than 200 chapters and cases. You can get 30 hours of free continuous medical education certification. And this is paid for by SP. So, you know, and it's accredited by the European Council for Medical Education. And anyone can learn about any topic in pediatric endocrine or diabetes. All the ISPED recent guidelines are in there. We have around 20 over 1,000 registered users from all over the world, from 156 countries. And tutors can use it to teach classrooms. Learners can use it to learn about pediatric endocrine and diabetes. And our ethos has always been it is free. It's globally free to use. You get free CME certification as well. I'm doing a talk on the 12th of October. And for the first time, SP is making it free. The webinar is going to be free for anyone to learn how to use the platform. I'll send it to Tino, if that's okay, so that you could hopefully advertise it because it's such an important free platform written by experts all over the world. So that's one of the things that I'm busy with. I'll be in ISPAD as well in October, also busy with other things. But yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe let's wait and see, Connor. <laughs> What's next? Great. Great, really. Thank you so much, Professor May. I just needed to know, how can people access them? You say that there was a gap that you wanted to fill with the knowledge that you heard. You wanted to read. You wished somebody had written about it. Now you were the one who wrote about it. So how can people access books that you've written about? They're fairly easily accessible. So they, if you Google me, the books will tend to come out. They're on Amazon as well. They have uh, two websites that they can go to. So www.peatsdoc.co.uk on the front page, 
all the books will be there and they can access it to either Amazon or directly from the publisher and they send it worldwide as well. And they're on Kindle and hard copy and paperback. So yeah, I, I think they're quite easily accessible. Google Professor Man. All those books will come out on Google. So that's that's great. So let's focus a little bit in your professional roles and membership. That includes ESPAT, Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology, Diabetes UK. There's a whole lot. So like, what does it mean to you? or to any medical doctor, being a member or a fellow of such extraordinary professionals. And I believe there are a whole lot. I think if you want to make a difference or an impact, then it's important to be part of these societies or associations because that's where you can contribute impactfully or effectively. Again, I think a lot of the roles that I do, I find that uh, they sometimes come to me because it was at the right time or at the right moment. And that was the time that I think I could contribute the most. And for young doctors or current doctors, if you feel that you can contribute more, whether it is to your local, regional or global sort of mission or aims, then join it. Join ISPAD if you think you can contribute something to global diabetes. Join SP if you're part of the European Endocrine Diabetes Initiatives. Join your local associations in your own countries. Royal College is our local pediatrics society. So Diabetes UK is again part of the UK's diabetes advocacy groups. And I think if you feel that you have a lot to contribute or you can even contribute a little bit, it doesn't matter. I think what matters is how your own journey is like and how you feel that, okay, I can do a little bit here. Let's see how that goes. Many of us have so much going on. I always say that every person has a story behind that person. Every family story behind. Don't judge people. Support them in what they think they could do. Sometimes they could do more if they feel supported. So for any aspiring doctors or current doctors or future doctors, look up these societies, whether it's global or national or in your own countries, Find out what their missions and aims are and find out how you can be a member and how you can contribute. You can start off in baby steps. Things will take its own journey eventually and will let you know how much you can do. But no one's asking you to be overstressed because a lot of us, we have our own family commitments, isn't it? And then we have our own work commitments. Everyone's a bit burnt out. This week, it's strikes again. We've had so many strikes in the UK. So don't get burnt out, but find your own path. Find your own journey and be curious. You know, I always say to my trainees as well, be curious about what is out there because you could do a little or you could do a lot or you could do somewhere in the middle. Find out what associations and societies are there. An inspiring answer for people who want to get engaged. Coming to the last question, before closing, we would like to thank you so much for having me here. I would like to ask you, how do you balance your personal with professional life? I may assume that you feel that you live a purpose-driven life, so that gives you fuel to continue to do the job. How do you manage, balance those things? If I had a penny for that question, <laughs> Connor, I really don't know. That I have to say there's a joke going on in all the hospitals that I work with that they think that there's a clones of me. They think that there's maybe a few clones of me um, hanging around. I think I'm organized. I'm very organized with my time. I use it effectively. I also feel it's really important to give quality time to my family, to my kids, my husband. They're very supportive now that they're a little bit more grown up as well. I don't have the answer to that. Maybe there's a clone of me. <laughs> That's the only joke that comes out all the time. I think we all have our own pace. I wouldn't compare. It's really important not to compare people. But yeah, I'm a good time organizer. That's all I can say. I think this is just great because I believe when we scheduled for this podcast, we wanted this. We hoped this was going to be face to face, but knowing how things would be for you, especially when you're at the conference, you're not just going to be reporting, you're going to be speaking at the conference. So you knew that you wouldn't be able to have a face to face meeting. I was thinking that too, Tino. Even now, I said, could we start a bit earlier because I have another meeting lined up in a couple of minutes. Each time I have this vision of my timetable and I want to use it effectively. I want to give you guys the quality time that you deserve. So thank you so much. I am really grateful. I have enjoyed talking to you, Tino and Connor, but thank you for asking me. Oh, thank you so much for being part of our podcast. It'll be out in October. 
before we meet at the conference. Maybe Suna Kona will be joining at this part because I think I'll be there up until 2030. So yeah, yeah Kona, we are looking I, forward I, to it. Now I'm starting my medical residency, so I feel like a bit freaked out. Don't. Enjoy it. I'll try. I just moved on to my new house yesterday. And I have to adapt now, but I will try to join. <laughs> so great. So thank you so much. I don't know if, Professor May, if you would want to say anything in closing, last words. I'm just grateful and thank you. And I think it's great that both of you are doing this. I think it's really wonderful because you guys have shown the same example, isn't it? Of your journey and having these podcasts and giving information out to the public and doctors and healthcare professionals. So I'm well done to you guys. That means a lot to us for your time, invaluable time. We cannot thank you enough for that. And with all being said, we'll dress okay. So thank you.